the majesty of our earth, the beauty of life? Are they the result of a natural process called evolution or the work of a divine creator? This question is at the heart of a struggle that has threatened to tear our nation apart. That's an outdated religious book. Science has shown you can't For fundamentalist Christians you can't like Ken Ham, biology. evolution is an so evil that biology. must be fought. You can't hold up your moral hand. Well, I think it's a war. It's a, it's a real battle between worldviews. For embattled teachers in Lafayette, Indiana, evolution is a truth that must be defended. I think they think someone will come out a victor, and I don't believe that that's going to be the case. If you look at the Bible, if you look For at Christian the students at Wheaton College, evolution is an idea that is hard to accept. Where is God's place if everything does have a natural cause? For all of us, the future of religion, science, and science education are at stake in the creation-evolution debate. Today, even as science continues to provide evidence supporting the theory of evolution, for millions of Americans, the most important question remains. What about God? Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to High Mill. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this ministry, for Ken Ham, and for the truth that he brings to Canton, Ohio, here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you like a brochure? Thank you. Oh, that sounds real good. Everybody, here we go. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation is true. I believe that God above created me and you. So praise his name for what he made. Give credit where it's due. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation's true. Over 140 years after Charles Darwin first seemed to challenge the creation accounts in Genesis, many conservative Christians are more committed than ever to fighting the war against evolution. Today, they have come here to the High Mill Church of the Resurrection for some basic training. I didn't crawl out of a pond or swing down from a tree. Adam is my ancestor and not a chimpanzee. God created everything in six days he was through. So the Big Bang Theory is just a dud and a million years are two. If you look at what the Bible says, if we start with the revealed Word of God and we build our thinking on the Bible, it tells us about the history of the universe from beginning to end. It says that God made everything Today, in six Today, biblical days. literalism has no more forceful an advocate than can Ham. Five to 10,000 people visit his website every day, and his 250 lectures each year reach over a million people, eager to hear his message that we need to look no further than the Bible to find the truth about who we are. I think it means Adam took fruit from the tree, you know. You see, people say, you have a particular interpretation of Genesis. I don't think so. I think I just read it. <laughs> and what it says is what it means. Other people interpret it and they get into trouble. That's a problem, I think. Now, I believe God created in six literal days and I believe it's important. In fact, I believe it re relates to the authority of Scripture and the Gospel. Now, people say to me, well, look, the point is, the word day can mean something other than ordinary day. And you know what? That's true. I had a pastor once who said, but the word day can mean something other than ordinary day. I said, that's true, but it can also mean an ordinary day. He said, that's true, but it can also mean something other than ordinary day. And I said, that's true, but it can also mean an ordinary day. <laughs> I said, look, pastor, does the word day ever mean day? Can day mean day or doesn't day mean day? And if day does mean day, when does day mean day? Can you give me an example when day means day? The Bible says, God created the earth covered with water, the sun, moon, and stars on day four. Well, that's very different to the Big Bang. If the Big Bang's true, well, the Bible got it wrong in astronomy. The Bible says there was a global flood, but uh, today we have a lot of people saying, no, there wasn't. Well, if the Bible gets it wrong in geology, 
and the Bible says God made distinct kinds of animals and plants to reproduce after their own kind, well, today evolutionists would say no one kind of animal changed into another over millions of years, so the Bible gets it wrong in biology, then why should I trust the Bible when it talks about morality and salvation? On this foundation here of, of creation, God's Word is truth. You sin and repent of your sin, people understand. Abortion's wrong, people understand. Homosexual behavior is wrong, people understand. But on this foundation, you sinner, what are you talking about? On this foundation of evolution, man determines truth. Homosexual behavior is wrong. No, it's not. Abortion's wrong. No, it's not. You see, what has happened is that this nation has changed foundation. And so have other nations around the world. No Ken Ham is not the first defender of the faith who is challenging accepted views of science to justify a literal reading of Genesis. Back in 1925, William Jennings Bryan capped his long career as a crusader for Christian values by upholding the state of Tennessee's law banning the teaching of evolution at the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Despite a scathing attack on his creationist views, Bryan prevailed. Scopes was fined $100. Within four years, 37 anti-evolution bills had been introduced in 20 states. It had a chilling effect on the teaching of evolution and the publishers of science textbooks. For decades, Darwin seemed to be locked out of America's public schools. But then, evolution received an unexpected boost from a very unlikely source, the Soviet Union. In 1957, Americans were horrified to learn that their Cold War communist rivals had beaten the U.S. into outer space with the launch of the satellite called Sputnik. The space race was on. Scientific education became a national priority. And as long neglected science programs were revived in America's classrooms, evolution was too. Biblical literalists have been doing their best to discredit Darwin's theory ever since. I want to teach you something very special this morning. The next time somebody says millions of years ago, I want you to put your hand up and say, excuse me, in a nice way, you say, were you there? Can you remember that? Next time somebody says millions of years ago, what do you say? Boy, I couldn't hear that. Next time somebody says millions of years ago, what do you say? Were you there? And you know what, mums and dads? The world scoffs at those of us who believe in Noah's flood and Noah's ark. Why let the world scoff by putting Noah's ark, look, making it look like a fairy tale? It wasn't a fairy tale. It was a real boat, wasn't it? What happened? Fountains of the deep broke open all over the earth. Volcanoes, tidal waves. But of course, all the animals, including dinosaurs on the ark, were safe, weren't they? What happened to those that didn't go on the ark? They drowned. Then what happened? They were covered in mud. What would you expect to find? Fossils. In fact, as Buddy's saying, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And boys and girls, do you know what you find? You find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, there really was a worldwide flood. Just a look at the stony curse. With billions of dead things buried in rock layers, eight down the water all over the earth. Real good singing for the morning. Let's see if we can make the whole town hear it. If you've been told all your life that the billions of dead things buried in the earth got there because of a worldwide flood, the evidence for an ancient earth comes as a shock. So we do see evidence of change, but how that change has occurred, whether it has occurred through some sort of a, as Darwin would have said, some sort of a natural selection, or if it's taken place through some sort of a design, if God has been directly involved in what we see as evolution, that's a bigger question. I think it's a more troubling question for an awful lot of Christians as well. We actually have a watering hole that existed here about 33 million years ago. And uh, many of the animals would die in this area, leaving their carcasses behind. And that's where we see a lot of the skeletons. At the Wheaton College Science Station in the Black Hills of South Dakota, the shock of the new has started more than one student on his or her way to an understanding of evolutionary history. You said the age of the site was around 30 million years old. How did you come to that uh, age? Like what processes do you decide on that age and come to that conclusion? When we have um, independent ages of, say, about 30 million years for the ashes, 
And then we find fossils that represent that type of development evolution-wise across the world that, that makes sense. What do you do when the evidence is before you, you're a scientist, the evidence is before you, and you want to say, well, then this completely goes against my whole upbringing. This completely goes against everything I have known to be true thus far. Can I toss it out the window? That's a struggle I've gone through this year. Where is God? Here, you look at it and tell me. Nathan Baird is a geology major in his final year at Wheaton College in Illinois. I believe we're good to go. This quiet campus is at the eye of a storm raging over opposing views about how life developed. Wheaton, one of the top 50 schools in America, is committed to exposing its students to the discoveries of science. But as a Christian college, it is also committed to preserving their faith in the God of the Bible. Students here are part of the largest religious group in America, conservative Christians. For them, conflicts between adherence to the Christian faith and the assertions of evolutionary theory are not just political or academic, they are personal. The emotions are very real and uh, they do play into the whole picture, I think, and it's because it's about something that's to do with human beings. It's to do with our very, very souls, our very existence, and that's what makes it so important, I think. Wheaton calls itself a marketplace of ideas, but some students inevitably feel threatened as they confront ways of thinking without precedent in the world from which they came. I was definitely, definitely indoctrinated in along, along those lines of this is, this is how Genesis 1 and 2 uh, entails the story of creation, and this is how it's got to be. And yes, evolution was portrayed as an evil, you know, it was, it was Satan's doing, and it's something that, you know, is, is the demise of the church if we, if we even listen to it. I, as a kid, I had the questions of, well, how did God create the earth? And, uh, you know, well, let's go back to Genesis 1, you know, and let's read the account. And it's, you know, God formed it. Uh, he, he separated the expanses. He, get, he created day and night. But my mind wants to know the details. It wants to know what happened. He's asked difficult questions. Nathan has asked difficult questions. But I think that that's the kind of person he is. He's not uh, willing just to take just what everybody else says or believe it because that's what everybody else believes. I think that he is really the kind of person who wants to get into the nitty gritty and wants to get real, really understand. One thing that I've realized is in what, talking with my mom and stuff going home, I go home, she says, so what, are you an evolutionist now? And it's, it's, the, it's the great evil. It's the great unknown evil, though. It's not even discussed. And that's what um, kind of perturbs me is before I came to Wheaton, one of my mom's friends said, don't let him go there. He's, that's such a liberal school. And at first, when I talked to him on the phone one time, I was a little nervous, and I think I even said to Jim something to the effect that I hope he hadn't, hasn't lost his faith. Holy, 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 holy. Long before Wheaton students like Nathan arrive on campus, the most important lesson they have learned is that the Bible is true from the very first word. I think that the reason why our church is growing and our pastor would say the same thing is because he preaches the Word of God, and that's all he does. He goes uh, line upon line, verse upon verse, um, book by book, and that is the only reason why our church is growing as fast as it is. This world in which we live has convinced us that this, this life is all about our getting what we want when we want it and, and supplying all of our needs so that we can enjoy all of this life. But the Bible tells us very clearly that this life is not about you and me. This life that you and I live is all about God. Coming home is a, is a good thing for me because I get to be in much more discussion with my parents and being reminded that, you know, I'm one of four kids. I have a fiance, I have a grandma who I go over and I mow her lawn. I'm not just a person who sits and studies physical chemistry all day. And that's why, for me, it's always been good when at Wheaton um, to call home and to talk to dad and mom, or when at home to be in conversation with them. Thank you for these times you've blessed us with as a family. And we just thank you for this time, Lord, and for the beautiful day and that we could have.